So now let me try. All right. Okay. Okay. So I will, and like I said, I'll just cut out this first part of the video when you guys are like talking and all that kind of stuff. Um, to like background, obviously we won't include that in the, when we post on YouTube <laughs> and on the website, <laughs> we'll, I'll cut it down to when you start. Okay. And when you end, <laughs> so no worries about that. You're, you're off. You're awesome. Yeah. That's like I said, awesome. I'm just going to like leave it here on my aunt's kitchen table, let it go. And then I'll come down at about eight 30 and, and um, Heather, Heather's going to need to share her screen. So is that a easy for her to do it should be yes um we if you click on down at the bottom of your controls can you click on share screen and there actually should be like permissions okay. i don't know why it okay i see share screen i clicked on share screen right yes. all right um no, yeah she that. should system preferences hmm. yeah like i can actually click on share screen and um at, even as not the host and i can share let me see if it'll let me share my screen you see it yes okay mm -hmm. so she should be able to easily share okay i think our default settings are that um anybody uh any participants can actually share their screen so if Lori jones is taking attendance for me and again do i need to let people in or does she need to let people in or can she let people in or yeah you're gonna have to make her a co-host but yes okay which i'll walk you through when she gets on <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm behind the times my dear I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay I don't do this enough to know <laughs> I'm going to text the girls and just tell them. Yeah, once I made you the host, I lost all of my permissions. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah, I did. There's Carrie. So I need to admit her. Hey, Carrie. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'll be outside. Here's such lovely critters. Hi, Carrie. Um, I need to change my name. You should be able to rename yourself. Oh, yeah. We had had um, a sorority 50th anniversary meeting. Mm -hmm. So we were instructed to put our pledge class and then the year we graduated. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. time. I don't know, I have to write it down because I, I got to think about it. All right. Who else? Um, other than Lori, um, uh, Jessica, Lori, and, um, sorry, um, Jessica, Lori, and Carrie, and Heather. Heather okay, is in the waiting room. There's Heather. Okay. Do you okay. need all of the ladies helping you to be co-hosts? That'd be great. Okay. Hi, Heather. Good to meet you. Hey, Heather. You too. Thank you so much for joining okay. us. <laughs> it's great. Um, oh, gosh. I've got really chapped lips, so and I haven't put any lipstick on yet. <laughs> I'm going to get some. I'm going to get water, um, but we're going to make sure everything's test right first, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, Amy, first, let's make sure that you can. So if you right click on Jessica's bubble person square rectangle i don't know what she is yeah <laughs> that <laughs> you should uh, be able to make her a co-host okay you see that yeah yep okay and you should be able to do that for carrie and heather i mean sorry heather uh carrie and um lori as well 
okay. then they can like see the chat and uh, admit people in. Are you, it, can you see that now, Jessica? You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Goodness. <laughs> yeah, I can see. And it, do you want me to admit Carrie back in? I don't know what yeah. happened. Yes. There you go. All right. And then we also want to make sure that Heather can share her screen and do all the things she needs to do. See it now. And just, and what I need to do is I need to get it. Um, let's see. I'm going to do the slideshow. Um, oh, I don't want it that big. Um, all right. Hang on. I've got to go to presenter view. Okay. That's right. Okay. So I do presenter view. And let me just see where I'm going to do my presenter. So I'm going to have it over here. There's my notes. All right. And now I'm going to go here. I'm going to do the portion of the screen. Share sound up and I optimize share. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. So. All right, so you should be seeing, mm -hmm. all right, good. Good. And then we're gonna go here. I'm just gonna make sure everything's gonna play yeah. properly. Um, all right, then there. Okay. I don't think I've got sound. Actually, there should have been sound there. Um, when you shared your screen, did you click the- um... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's because of the link. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, it's okay. I'm just, I'm just gonna, so that, da, da, da. oh, good. That one's working now. Um, okay, there, that's a double click. Okay, da, da, da. that's okay. Okay. Look at that's working. Uh, there it goes. Why isn't that moving? You can hate each other, but not to kill each other. You can hear that? Yes. yes. I said so many nice words, you know, but uh, tell me, uh, who is listening to me? Oh, gosh, she makes me cry. I know. I've seen, <laughs> yeah. I've seen that clip before. I know. Um, all right. And then um, this is now. I wanted to, I might, um, so if I want to go, let me just go here. Um, Lori said her computer's being just a little uncooperative, but she's trying to get in. I told her to, no okay. worry. Um, all right, now. If I had this up on screen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that's what you're seeing right here, right? Yes. Just that. So mm -hmm. I could, I'm afraid if I make this smaller. That's, yeah, that's good. Better. Yeah, I just want to make sure it doesn't make the rest of it smaller. Okay, so that's, uh, but the problem is, um, so I'll have to, I'll have to move it. 
Um, let's see, there's also music on here. Is that working? There should be music going. All right, so if I go to the, so if I want to show um, the website, I'll just have to move the box. Okay. Um, and I will go right to teachers. Oh, I will hear it now. Okay, there's, that's the curriculum. Okay, good. All right. All right, now I don't, um, actually I'll go. Unfortunately, the hot timeline's gone. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> um, so, okay, good. So there we go. And that is the hey, Lori. Uh, reset. Wait. Reset. Why isn't it resetting? All right, the option of renaming myself is not appearing. So I'm just going to be Caribbean 15 Alpha Omega. <laughs> I think that's okay. <laughs> it's like just not coming up, which I love, you know? Yeah. It may be too, because um, we have, we upgraded our Zoom account. Mm -hmm. um, and so it restricts what participants can do because um, mm -hmm. we can take up to 500 now instead of 100. Gotcha. So um, we're anticipating a lot of things in the spring. And uh, so it might be because of that. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'll rock it. Before Lori has to, to leave, um, I wanted uh, to introduce ourselves to Heather. And um, mm -hmm. now that she's got everything working and uh, I'll let Lori go first, Heather, she is the one who um, actually wrote the tech sets um, for Rena's Promise. So I'll let her tell her a little bit about yourself, Lori. Yeah. Hi, Heather. Um, so I am a teacher in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and uh, for 29 years in the English classroom, um, and um, read Rena's Promise just a couple of years ago, actually, um, and had the privilege of writing all of the lessons around um, the text, and wow. um, really excited about using it um, in my classroom. We've had a lot of teachers really respond already, because um, we just posted it last month, um, so it's all fairly new for our state and we've, we've got a lot of really good positive feedback already on the, on the tech set. Um, so, uh, I am, uh, uh super excited to hear. I'm actually going to have to watch the recording cause I've got four kiddos up the street. Um, my, my internet was cut today by some people bulldozing. <laughs> so Hi. I'm at my aunt's house. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to be in and out and all that kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm so excited to, to hear from you. And I've, I've been, um, I just got your, um, next book as well. The, oh, I can't think of the name. Yes. that one. Yes. Yes. So Perfect. I'm really looking forward to reading that and hearing what you have to say and, um, incorporating it into my classroom. So yeah. well, thank you. A, it may be a bit advanced. I don't know. It's, I don't know if high school, well, I, you know, it depends on the student. Um, yeah. I'm so curious what your lessons are that you're doing. What, how are you, um, what, how, how are you teaching Rena's Promise? I'm so interested in that. Um, well, we actually developed, um, <clears throat> I think it's like a 15 or 16 lesson plan unit um, around Rena's Promise. And we actually, and this was for the state of North Carolina, um, which we just had a mandate go live to teach about the Holocaust. And we have two um, basically units at every grade level for English teachers and Knight and Rena's Promise are the two at 10th grade. Um, and both text sets complement each other. So teachers who are teaching Knight, if they wanted to teach excerpts from Rena's Promise or the other way around teaching Rena's Promise and maybe some excerpts from Knight to talk about um, you know, male and female perspectives um, at Auschwitz. Um, and then we have like three or four culminating activities as well. Um, but I'll be happy to share the, um, the link with you. Um, but it's like a full standards based, um, lesson. And we basically go in chronological order leading up to, um, uh, with some background information, um, about, um, you know, where Reno was and, and all that kind of stuff before she's, uh, deported, but we break the book into sections so that teachers can, um, decide which parts um, they want to focus on more. Um, but we do have a fully published um, unit based on Rena's Promise. 
I'm so I'm just, I'm just so honored. That's so amazing. And you know, I lived in Winston Salem. Did you? I did not know that. Yeah, when I was writing Rena's Promise. What? Really? Yeah, I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. So um yeah, so it's actually on our website. Um teachers have been downloading it and using it and buying tech sets of and uh, buying classroom sets of Rena's Promise. So gosh, um, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so cool. I I um I I will give you a, a a little I'll give you two little secret stories. So okay. I uh, one of the reasons I think I wrote about Auschwitz and how cold it was so well was because I had no heat in my house. <laughs> because the filter, I didn't know you're supposed to change filters in a house. <laughs> and so it was always 50 degrees. And I remember like waking up in the morning going, how the hell did she get out of, you know, get it live in a bunk in Poland in the winter? I was like, you know, like, how do you do that? I was, you know, I was so cold. I didn't want to get out of bed and get a cup of coffee. Um, so yeah, so I was able to um, push my uh, imagination that way. And also um, just, I mean, and this is, this is a, absolutely a straight quote from Rena. Eli Wiesel mm -hmm. um, did not endorse Rena's promise when it came out. That publisher really? went to him with the book and he um, decided he wouldn't endorse it. And I was really shocked and sort of offended. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rena said oh of course he didn't and i said why and she goes i'm a peasant oh. huh. and it was the first time i realized that there was classism in holocaust survival wow mm -hmm. um huh. and it was well yeah well, we amazing? got him back because now we pair the two books <laughs> isn't that amazing and it, it never it never occurred to me um but sure enough there there was um there was a level of classism as to how people helped each other and of course the peasant girls helped each other and mm -hmm. were stocky and you know and helped each mm -hmm. other survive but the same the same was true for intellectuals and and better educated people that is a fascinating Isn't story fascinating? Yeah. yeah you've never written about yeah. that I mean, really it it it'd probably get me in trouble Oh yeah, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually, that that's an interesting reaction. I think I would have the same reaction you did. Yeah, um, I was but, really, uh, I, was, I was quite shocked, and um, yeah, really, really interesting. I'm a peasant. She only had an eighth grade education, you know, oh, and he was, yeah. he was, you know, a city boy and well educated, or yeah. you know, young. Yeah. But huh. yeah. Anyway, there you go. Yeah. Two little okay. tidbits. Isn't that interesting. It's interesting. Well, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then Lori, if you need to run on, we're good. Um, I appreciate you helping us get everything together and, and the recording is actually going now so that we can. But I'll be cutting out all of this part. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then okay. there's Jessica, my partner in crime. <laughs> hey, Jessica. Hi. I teach um, in McDowell County in Marion, which is like west of Asheville. And east, yeah, I east of Asheville. Oh, do you? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Yeah, I lived in Burke County before I moved down to Winston Salem, and wow. I worked in the court system in McDowell and Burke. Bloody Burke. Really? Bloody Burke. Oh, what, okay. what years were those, Heather? What years? Uh, that was um, late eighties. Okay. Late okay. 80s. And then I, I lived in McDowell County too. Keep the yeah. volume on. Is that okay? Yeah. Actually, Lori, you still there? <laughs> Maybe she cut out. Yeah, I'm here. I, I, I'm i muting. I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, Jessica and I taught at McDowell together. We were, we, we taught, we taught a um, class together. Uh, and Jessica has a Holocaust elective class this year at McDowell. So, and I got to come in and speak with her students about life after survival. So that was oh, great. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. And then Carrie Boone up in Boone. <laughs> Hi, um, I teach at Watauga High School in Boone, um, and I teach world history, AP world history, a leadership class, um, and I also teach a Holocaust and genocide elect. Wow. Yeah. And Lori Jones down in the corner there. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lori Jones, and I teach um, middle school, seventh grade, and at uh, Harris Middle School in Spruce Pond which is in Mitchell County. I'm about halfway between Boone and Asheville. I'm 
I'm northwest of uh, Amy. Yeah. And so we have, we have regions that um, we've set up all across the state. Uh, there's eight regions, right, y'all? Eight regions. And we are the northwest region, region eight. And um, we've got it from the coast to the to, from Murphy to Manio, we've got these regions covered with people who act in counties to help us get word out about programming and um, all kinds of things. And these are these are our co-regional directors, and I'm the regional director for Region 7. So when we do programs and webinars, um, they help us, and I couldn't do it without them. So they're incredible human beings, and I love every one of you. You're precious. <laughs> um, so the the format tonight will just be a brief welcome from me. Um, and I want to go ahead and mention, uh, I've already had some emails about, um, CEUs and things like that. So I'm just going to briefly mention the process for that. They need to stay for the entire webinar if possible. Um, Lori, I'm going to let you kind of monitor, monitor all that. And then evaluation, we'll have an evaluation of the webinar and they'll have to fill that out before they get their CEUs. Um, and then, uh, I'll let the team introduce themselves very briefly, um, and uh, Jessica is going to be the one to monitor the chat. We thought we would ask folks um, to put questions in the chat as they think of things. And that way at the very end, when we have time, she'll go, are you comfortable doing that, Jessica? Just presenting those questions as they come into the chat at the end. Um, and um, Lori is going to take attendance for us and Carrie is going to introduce you, Heather, um, just from your bio, from your website. So, and then we'll get right on into the program and let you have as much time as, as we can possibly let you have. So we're just so grateful that you're here. And um, we had over 65 people register for the webinar. I don't know how many people will actually be able to attend. It's usually less than that, but um, that's a good number for us. Uh, we've promoted the program. So hopefully we'll have a good, good attendance. I'm so, so really touched. This is great. Really excited yeah. about this. Yeah. Um, Do you have any questions or I'm going to run downstairs and get my water sure. and, um, and uh, I will be, and, you know, have pee and, um, and <laughs> okay. I will get back up here. Um, are, do you have a screensaver that you have that's up when people come in or anything like that? Or. No, um, so we just admit them. We um, no, we don't have anything running, but if there's something you want to put up, um, you're welcome to. Yeah, just Lord, you should be able to admit people. I made you co-host. Um, so okay. when we see someone pop up, if you will look and see if you're able to admit them, if not, I'll do it, but. Okay. I'll still keep up with it if you want me to. Okay. That'd be uh, great. If, if you have to admit them, I've got, I've printed out that spreadsheet. Okay. And I'm just going to make a check by their name and then I'll go in tomorrow and update it for you. So yeah. Okay. And there's no rush. There's no rush to do okay. that. Folks can wait until the end of the week or next week before we, I mean, they'll have to fill out the evaluations anyway, too, before they get their CEUs. So yeah, Heather, you go ahead and do whatever you need to do. And well, I'm just thinking, so we could do this. I am so excited for this. I don't, I, how is this going to be distributed, Heather? Are you, is it just, uh, we are, we're meeting with the distributor next week, as soon as the world, we have the world premiere and then, and, and then we'll be able, we may be actually having an educational distributor take it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, but right now we could have this on screen or we could have this. I think the, the documentary is fine with me. Okay. I, I hope you're going to be able to speak about, we want you to speak also about um, your documentary and your other two works as well. Yeah. So. yeah. I probably won't talk about star cross just because this is, um, this is all about the first transport and it's right. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, so, so if I make this wider, can you see that screen now, the full thing? Yeah, I can see it. So you get the whole, Okay. Um, okay, good. Well, I will go get my water. I'll leave this on screen. So at least people come when they come in, there's some something to look at. Okay. So if you guys want to get off screen, you can. <laughs> okay. I'm good right now. It's great to meet you all. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I, it's really, Thank you. I think Rena would be so happy that we're all together. And yeah. Um, yeah. 
still doing the work of doing her work. Right, right, exactly. Especially now. Mm. Great. Okay, I will be right back. And, okay. Um, I don't. I guess I don't have to mute myself. Um, but I can. Let me see. Okay, I'll just. Yeah. Okay. You and we're starting at seven, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. but are you letting people in at seven or earlier? Don't they like have a waiting room? They're in the waiting room. I don't know. Y'all tell me. I can't remember. Do we leave them in the waiting so. room? Probably yeah, yeah. 655 will start admitting people. Is that what we usually do? Like 655 will start letting people mm -hmm. in, but we won't start till right at seven. I'll go get my water. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hey, Amy, when do you want me to make the comment about the chat? Do you want me to do that when I introduce myself? Yes. Is that okay? No, That's fine. Y'all, how cold is it at your all's houses? Because I'm like freezing in my house right now. It's freezing oh my God. At, at work uh, today and yesterday we had no heat. So I sat for nine hours oh. in 58, 60 degree weather. In the oh library. my gosh. Uh -uh. No, I would have said, uh-uh, peace out. I'm going home. Mm -hmm. Their, your heat's not on? They are renovating. Um, I don't know if you've been out there in a while. They're renovating uh -huh. all the student service area up top. And so they're putting in new heating and air and we don't have any right now. So we froze. I told Joy to dress warmly tomorrow. <laughs> oh my God. Cool. In the waiting room. So we, like leave them in the waiting room until, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Don't keep them. Yeah. Yeah, I think you cut out Lori a little bit. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's still cutting out. Just still, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yay. COVID hit our house. Oh no. Three years my husband got it, but I didn't get it. I don't I haven't had it yet. That I that Oh I wow. That's awesome. But I just had my booster two weeks ago too, so I, I don't know. The week I was going to get my booster is the week I got COVID. So, <laughs> happened to me last year. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what the heck? I'm trying to be proactive. <laughs> but, yeah. <clears throat> Crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody's classes are going well. As crazy yeah. as they are. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm telling you. Out. You're Mike. cutting out, Lori. I'm so I'm sorry. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Hi, Hi Mike. Mike. Hello, Amy. Hello, Jessica. Hello. Hey, Carrie. Hello. Hello, Lori. Hello. Your your mute's not your um. Uh, yeah, her audio. Audio. Oh, she knows. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're good to go. We're just going to wait till about 6.55 um, and then start letting folks in and everything's set up and Heather will be ready to go at 7. I don't know what I'm doing. I can hear you now. <laughs> can you? Okay. <laughs> hey, Lori, can you, see, can you see the Kristen entered the waiting room? Can you see that? I can, yes. Okay, so you're able to let folks in. Uh, yes. I see okay. it too, Amy. Okay. Yeah, we're going to let them in at 6.55. Right, right. I minute. just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've got two. Is it is my audio better now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. We've got two people in the waiting room, I think. How are your classes going, Carrie? They're they're pretty good. My old freshmen are they struggle. Like they're just they don't really remember anything from middle school, which I can't, you know, thinking they were like in fifth grade, right? Mm -hmm. COVID ish time. So they're missing some of that foundational stuff, but that's mm -hmm. only 
16 kids. And then I have my AP classes are doing really, really well. My Holocaust class is pretty small, but the kids are like very committed and motivated and that it's such a good group this year that's good and my leadership class is kind of precious so mm -hmm. all is good Jessica where are you um in the in the elective right now what are y'all doing um we're looking at we just are starting looking at some other genocides so we're working on Cambodia right now there's not a lot out there, actually. It's kind there of is not. It is crazy. That one is always, I feel like, the hardest one to teach because there is so little. Like I started looking around and I was it. like, what? Yeah. There's a book that I found that I need to sit down and read before, I, obviously, I get to that point. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but I'm like, I'm going to have to like read that and pull things from that too to give to the kids because there's not a ton of like I and mean, there's not many survivors so there's you know not a ton of testimony or anything like that um do, do you think we should start letting people yeah we can start letting people in mike as soon as heather comes back i'll i'll make sure that i introduce you to her all right i'm going to start admitting people okay So we're waiting for some other folks to join in. We're going to try to get started right at seven. Heather is here. Uh, she went to get some water and then we will start in just a couple of minutes. There's Heather. Heather, I wanted to introduce you to our council chairperson, Michael Abramson. Michael, Hi, this Michael. is Heather. Great to meet you. Hello, Heather. How are hey. you? We're hey. honored to have you Thanks tonight. Thanks so for having me here. Yeah, we're honored to have you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I was looking forward to uh, 
hearing from you as soon as Amy told me the date. I had it on my calendar. That's so kind of you. Thank you so oh, much. Sure. And I read the book. <laughs> I bought a lot of them. Believe me, I bought a lot of books for schools. $11,000 <laughs> worth of books. A lot of them are in his promise. <laughs> I might make a dollar off that. <laughs> I hope so. I, I hope so. But I have to tell you, I want you to know you have literally thousands of students reading it from North Carolina. Wow. Yep, oh, it, God. It's on the recommended list, thanks to Amy. So thank you. I, wait till I tell the family. They will be yes. just blown away. They will be yep. so, so happy to hear that. Absolutely. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? I just re realized I forgot something. Let me go grab it. <laughs> sure. sure. Okay. There. Now I'm ready. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know people will continue to join. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Amy Clark, and I am the Region 7 Director for uh, North Carolina Council on the Holocaust Programming. Um, and I have uh, been looking forward to this for a very long time. Heather uh, Dune McAdam is joining us tonight to talk about her work with Rena's Promise and um, her documentary, which is going to premiere very soon that ties into Rena's story. Uh, so we're so grateful that you've joined us tonight, Heather, and we can't wait to, to hear from you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things for those of us, uh, those of you who are, are thinking about your CEUs and your certificates. Um, <clears throat> you will be getting CEU credits tonight for uh, attending the webinar, but we were gonna ask you to fill out an evaluation and I will send that link out to you probably sometime later on this week. And then you will get your certificate for your CEUs. And we do ask that you stay for the majority, if not all of the webinar in order to honor that CEU credit. Uh, I have a wonderful team of lovely human beings who help me do these webinars. And I'm so grateful to them that they're helping again tonight. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then we will um, let Heather take over the programming. So we're going to start with, um, we'll start with uh, Jessica. Just tell us who you are, where you're from. Hi, I'm Jessica Ferguson. I teach English at McDowell High School in Marion. And um, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions um, during the webinar, if you'll just put those in the chat, and then we should have some time at the end to get to those. Okay, thanks, Jessica. And Lori Jones. Hello, I'm Lori Jones, and I teach uh, seventh grade social studies at Harris Middle School in Spruce Pine. And Carrie Boone, who will introduce Heather to us. Yes. Hi, I'm Carrie Boone. I am a social studies teacher at Watauga High School in Boone, and I do have the pleasure tonight of introducing Heather Dune McAdam. Um, so Heather began her career as a performance artist and dancer with the Martha Graham Contemporary Dance Company. After an academic or accident prematurely ended her performing career, she began writing. Um, and then from there, her, um, she is the acclaimed author of 999, The Extraordinary Young Woman of the First Official Jewish Transport to Auschwitz, which is a PEN America Literary Award finalist top five in the Goodreads Choice Awards finals, and an Amazon Best of the Year selection, translated into 19 languages. She is also the producer and director of the documentary film by the same title. Her first book, Rena's Promise, The Story of Sisters in Auschwitz, was also about the first transport. Her most recent work, Starcrossed, a true Romeo and Juliet love story in Hitler's Paris, tells a beautiful story of love, war and betrayal in Nazi-occupied Paris. McAdam's work in the battle against Holocaust denial has been recognized by Yad Vashem in the UK and Israel, the US Shoah Foundation, the National Museum of Jewish History in Bratislava, Slovakia, and the Pansto Museum of Auschwitz in Oswiecim, Poland. Heather is a member of PIN. She sat on the board for the Cities of Peace, Auschwitz, and is the founder of Rena's Promise Foundation. Her writing has been featured in National Geographic, 
The Guardian, Sunday Times, New York Times, and on NPR's All Things Considered, as well as many other major media outlets. So without further ado, we're going to hand it over to you, Heather. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Um, I haven't been to North Carolina in a few years, um, but it's lovely to have this connection, which, of course, I met Rena uh, in North Carolina, and I used to drive from Winston-Salem all the way up to uh, Asheville, Hendersonville. And uh, every weekend, um, and interview her and work on this book. So I'm gonna do a screen share, um, and I'm gonna start off just uh, showing you the trailer for the documentary because I think you guys might be interested in that. Um, and I think it's gonna work. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Let's try it. Um, make that a little smaller there. There. I am the 173rd Jewish woman who ever entered Auschwitz. An untold story until now. Before they became the first Jews deported to Auschwitz, these teenage girls had their whole lives ahead of them, full of hopes and dreams that the world was about to change forever. One morning we wake up and we saw an announcement that all the non-married Jewish girls from 16 up have to come to the school for work. We thought we can help our families and support them. So we said, oh, that'd be wonderful. I said, I want to go with my friends. Friends are very important at that point. So I, uh, I didn't want to be left behind. We went, assuming that we will come back in six months. Eager to help their families, most girls went willingly. Their true fate had been lost to history. But for the first time, the survivors tell the story of what really happened. Nobody ever heard of Auschwitz. We didn't even realize what's happening to us. The guards started screaming. Up, up, thirty Jewish horse. Who cared about hundred girls who went to Germany to work? We were the first thousand women who ever entered the gates of hell there. gonna cry <laughs> oh god um i get so emotional with this material um so for those of you who don't know we do have a website i actually have two um there is arenaspromise.com and uh and there are materials there um years ago we decided to set up an educational curriculum um, i set up a foundation and there's information about the book because the new edition they didn't include the photo insert which was really upsetting i thought they would so um, a lot of the family photos you can find um, on that website and um, and i will talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later but um, this you know, this all started with Rena, <laughs> and um, and you know, I I interviewed Rena. I wrote we wrote Rena's promise together, and um, and it came out in 1995. And then uh, 27 years later, <laughs> I was living in England. I gotta wipe my eyes, sorry. And um, I was living in England, and I realized that I could fly to Slovakia for like I don't know. $14. <laughs> it's very cheap on Ryanair. And I also realized that it was the, um, I think it was the 70th anniversary of the first transport. It was uh, 2012. So I got a camera. I don't know why. I just thought, I thought I should film the whole thing. And it was, um, I have a YouTube channel now. Um, I it started a YouTube channel um, uh, when I was a teacher and I, I just thought I would vlog. 
I don't know that anybody was blogging yet, but I thought I will film and post my videos as I travel. And I decided I was going to um, go to Poprad, where the first transport originated from. And I was going to take a train to Auschwitz. Um, there are no direct trains. Um, and it ended up taking us all the way into the uh, Czech and then over um, to uh, to all the way through Poland. It took about 10 hours. Um, it's not that far. If you drive it, it's just a couple of hours. Um, but I wanted to have a feeling of the train. I wanted to see the, I wanted to see the landscape and I wanted to feel like what it's, a, what was it like to be, um, cause we know it took a really long time to get there. Um, I now know through my research for 999 that they left at eight o'clock in the evening because I found, um, I, I can, that trip I connected to um, uh, historians in Slovakia who had information about the transport that um, had never really made it out to the West. Uh, Slovakia was a small country, it was behind the Iron Curtain. And uh, so a lot of this information that I, um, when I was writing Rena's Promise would have been very hard to, to access because there was no internet um, or there was, but it was pretty rudimentary at that point. Um, you know, the Iron Curtain had just come down uh, just a few years. And uh, and so things were just sort of coming and uh, forward. And I I showed up, uh, you know, in 2012, and and still there was not a lot of communication. And I've always been so um, shocked. I mean, I've had arguments. <laughs> I've had arguments with uh, historians that are, um, uh, you know, much better known than me, and and uh, who disagree that this was the first transport to Auschwitz. Um, and uh, and I, so, so anyway, I started on this journey um, and without going too far into, uh, I will talk more about the official transport because I did find that information. But um, one of the, you know, on this trip from Slovakia to Auschwitz, um, I was carrying a list that I had compiled with the help of the USC Shoah Foundation. And on that list was the name of Adela Gross. So the list that I compiled was based on testimonies that the USC Shoah Foundation had collected. There were tw uh, 20 people who had survived the first transport who had given their testimonies or were giving their testimonies. And, and so I, I had that list. And then I had names of people that Rena knew and then I had, uh, and and that and that was it. And Rena knew Adela Gross, and Adela had died in Auschwitz. So what happens? So I leave her name, <laughs> uh, in Poprad underneath a plaque. I discover a plaque, and I, and I, um, there's there's a it's a big thing that the anniversary was a really big thing in in Slovakia the prime minister was there they had a big um, ceremony there were stones by this plaque there were flowers and I show up uh, you know this little American and I've got a list that I've compiled and I have a letter from the chief rabbi of England and I put those there. And Adela Gross's family, some of her surviving family was in Slovakia and they saw her name and they got hold of me. At the same time that that was happening in Slovakia, her family in California, uh, Joan Gross, who was married to Lou, was reading Rena's Promise. And, and she's reading it and she goes, Lou, your cousin's in this book. They had never known what happened to Adela. I mean, they knew she went to Auschwitz, they knew she disappeared, but they had no idea what had happened to her. And Rena provided that information. She saw her going to the gas chamber. So this is, you know, 2012 and Adela died in 1942. And I went like, suddenly, it was like lightning. I was like, there have to be so many more stories out there. I thought Rena was it. Rena wasn't it, right? So people, um, 
I had to argue with my uh, producers <laughs> in the in the documentary to keep Adela in the movie because it was really hard um, without having a survivor talk about it, you know. Um, and we didn't have Rena on tape talking about Adela. It was in the book, but I really I figured out a way to get Adela into the film, and and part of the reason she is so important is because. Um, her death is personal. It is a it is um, it is actual, but it works as a metaphor for so many other girls who were who died that we will never know. We will never see their faces. We will never know their. We might know their names, but we will never know their families. The whole families are wiped out, right? So, um, so this is Adela here. This beautiful um, looks like she has black hair, but she had very very red hair. This is her friend Henia Ehrenberger. Um, she does not survive. Uh, this is another woman, who, girl that I don't know her name, um, but she appears in a couple of other photos and I don't think she survives because I don't see any photos of her after the war. Um, and we don't know anybody else in this photo. Uh, but the, suddenly the work that I discovered from that trip was, was the work of connecting um, these families to their, to their history. And, and giving attention to those who've disappeared. Uh, and then of course, there's the question of why did they take girls? So the other, the, for me, um, when I teach uh, Rena's Promise, when I, when I talk about Holocaust, it's also grueling and difficult and, and it can be really depressing. And I do try to look for the positive, like, how can we turn this around and make it powerful and meaningful for students so they don't, you know, feel like going out and slitting their wrists or they don't hate Holocaust studies, right? We want them to uh, connect. So in the Jewish tradition, there are three deaths. The first is when the body ceases to function. The second is when the body is consigned to the grave. And the third is that moment when your name is spoken for the last time. Now I'm adding to that, there's a fourth. And that's when we, when, when, when you have a photo and you don't know who that person is, when we connect that name to the photo, it's more than saying the name, right? So the idea of saying names at the Auschwitz memorials is the way that we keep from dying that third death and then again i say by connecting these photos to names we keep these girls alive and we see their faces so every single girl in this photo um or well so this is olga olinka hartman this is her cousin magduska magda han magda amster um this is uh uh, Edith's sister Leah and her best friend Anna Herzkovikova. Um, and this is Anu Moskovitz, who really loved um, Edith's mother's bread. I mean, like these are these are real people, right? And when we make them real, uh, like Magduska, um, her mother was in a wheelchair and she was her carer. Uh, we we discover we have uh, our hearts open more to this material. Um, this is one of my favorite photos that I found uh, when I was working on, um, on 999 and uh, they are making matzah and, uh, oops, sorry, I've, I've missed it. Um, I was trying to get these little guys to dissolve. Um, so this is Bertha Berkowitz and um, Herschel. They're the only two people in this photo who survived. Um, and this photo, I think it's, uh, yes, yeah, it's Passover 1940. And you can see the matzahs that they're holding and the way they rolled them, right? Those are the, the rolling pins to make the matzahs. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's such a great glimpse into the culture of the time. So um, I'm gonna show you a few archival things, which I found in my work uh, going into 999. This is the ticket um, or the, um, the invoice uh, for the deportation of the girls. And uh, you can see it says they're going to Auschwitz. Um, as we say in the movie, it's a one-way ticket. 
they write there's 1,000, there are only 999, and they write the cost. And this is the sub government had to pay um, 3,700 Reichmark um, and 360 uh, Reichmark for their luggage. And there's the date, March 25th, 1942. Uh, one of our survivors, that's her, uh, her 19th birthday. So uh, when I got this document, it was sent to me by somebody in Germany whose mother was a survivor and who had worked for uh, in Auschwitz in the office uh, with, under a Gestapo, uh, member of the Gestapo. And um, I, I don't know how she got it. <laughs> I have no idea because she had already died, but it was so extraordinary. The first thing I did was I sent it to the archives in Auschwitz and um, to make sure they had it. Um, and they did they did have an original copy. Um, the, what, sh, what the family had was a photocopy. Um, so this is another list that, um, and the, what happens is, um, so this is actually a survivor's daughter. Her name is Orna Tuckman. Um, she lives in Australia. She and I traveled um, late, uh, a few years later, we went from Popra to Auschwitz together. That's her mother's name right there. Um, so the list, the actual list of um, names is, uh, has 999 names on it. Uh, this list over here is actually uh, how the girls were collected in uh, from their towns. And so this is from Homina where Rena was uh, and it's alphabetical order. So you can see this is Edita Friedmanova and Leah Friedmanova. Those are uh, Edita survives and she is the core, um, what do I say? She's the spine of the book in 999 and she grew up in Homina. And uh, she is, and she was an incredible source for me because uh, she knew everybody. And so what's different from Rena's story, and, and I call her Edith actually, is that Rena was hiding in Slovakia. So she she knew she knew people from synagogue. She knew Adela Gross, but it was more peripheral, right? Edith had grown up with Adela. In fact, after the war, Edith marries Adela's um, brother-in-law, if, if Adela has survived. And Adela's sister becomes her sister-in-law. It's a very small community. And I didn't know this when I was you know, writing Rena's Promise. I knew Rena's perspective on this town in Homina, but I didn't know um, what it was like to grow up there. And Edith was able to tell me. And a lot of what um, you see in the um, in, in the trailer, a lot of these home movies are actually of um, family who was connected to the Gross family that who lived in America, and they came back in 1938 and they filmed Homina, and uh, and you can see exactly what it looked like. It's incredible archive that I found in the Holocaust Museum in uh, D.C. So. Edith gives me a completely different perspective on what what happened before the the transport, and she shows us um, the the relationships between these girls. And in the list, when I went into the actual list, um, which is what what you're seeing here, uh, with Orna is looking through, and it's a stack of papers. Um, Edith, um, Edith is at the bottom with Leia and Adela Gross. They're not, it's not alphabetical order. It's very random. And, and Rena and Erna Drenger at the top. And my, my belief is that that list was typed in the order that they got onto the transport into the cattle cars. So I think that Edith and Rena were in the same cattle car. Uh, I have no way of proving that because they didn't actually know each other. And uh, and Rena, her memory of the of the transport itself was quite spotty. Um, Edith, uh, Edith was not so good either. But the multiple narrative that I pulled together in nine nine nine, I do have. I find women who remember that transport, who remember what happened, and I'm able to weave together these separate narratives and build a cohesive. A picture of 
what this experience was for these young women. Um, so of course, uh, you guys have read Rena's Promise, you know that they arrive, they um, go into Auschwitz, which is a men's camp. This is an original drawing of the camp. And uh, they have drawn a red line there where they built the wall. And it is the only, um, only archive we have that indicates a wall in Auschwitz. And, um, and these were the women's 10 blocks. This is block 10 where uh, the first girls were put. And uh, this is the block of death right there. And you will see now this is block 10. And this is me going in in 2012 with uh, Doretta um, Neusch, who's a researcher in, uh, in Aschwenschum at the museum. This is uh, actually inside block 10. It's actually closed to the public, but I'm allowed to go in there. Uh, every time I go, they let me in. <laughs> um, so Rena always talked about being upstairs. So I, of course I head upstairs. And um, this would have, this was the block elders room or the room elders, that's where they were. And this is the room where the bunk beds would have been would would have been. And you can see if you remember the slats in the window, how she peered out down and watching the Russians being executed, the slats in the window, they're um, still there. So that is, um, and then this, uh, so this is part of the film. One of the issues we have, of course, um, you, I can, you can describe anything in a book, right? But you can't describe anything in a film, you have to show it. So we hired an artist to actually, um, and I'll just, I'm just gonna uh, hang on, I'll go back there so you can see this again. Um, is it gonna play? It's not gonna play, can I make it play? There, okay. Um, so one of the issues we have is showing what the girls look like. So we hired a portrait artist. She was actually Polish and she, we had photographs of the, of some of the girls, right? Survivors and non-survivors. And she um, put them into Russian uniforms. She did research on what the Russians look like. This here is Adela Gross, a little bit of red up there. Uh, this is Hanya, or sorry, Anna Herskovikova, who is sta was standing next to uh, Leia in the story. Um, this is Bertha Berkowitz. This is Irina Fine. This is Edith Fallow, who survives with her sister as well. Um, and uh, so each of these pictures are an actual portrait of a young woman who was in the on the first transport. And you can see the red bowls and... Uh, and we tried to show how large the clothes were. I did a lot of, <clears throat> I drove her crazy, making sure it was accurate. Like Adela, I was like, they didn't have dresses. <laughs> it's like, she gotta, gotta put pants on her. <laughs> um, this is the only photograph, surviving photograph of a girl on the from the first transport. We do not know her name. Um, there, we did have, uh, somebody thought it might've been her aunt, but when she showed it to her mother, uh, her mother said, no, it wasn't, it wasn't her aunt. Her aunt had, had not survived. Um, so we don't have her name, but we do have her number. Um, and, and, you know, somewhere, someplace, uh, Rena, Edith, all of them would have had these kinds of mug shots. Um, what we have to remember is that, um, is that in 1945, if you recall, uh, there's a huge conflagration of, of burning of all the papers. And the SS have the girls that work in the office destroy the records. And, uh, and a lot of those records uh, were not duplicated for some reason. I mean, the Germans were really good at keeping records, but for some reason, and I think it's because they knew um, they knew better. Uh, they knew what they were doing to women was wrong and would be, uh, they would, you know, everything they were doing, um, the stuff that that would sit harder. And uh, that's my opinion. Uh, we also, I was just talking to uh, one of the heads of the research in Auschwitz and, um, and he was uh, also reminding me that the other thing that happened was the Russians liberated Auschwitz and they took some of the archive. So the archives are sort of split between Germany and Russia 
and then what was left there surviving in Poland and then what was destroyed. So we don't, there may, uh, we may never find any other photographs of, of women from the first transport. There are very, very few surviving prisoner photos of women. I've looked at all of them. There's less than a hundred and there were thousands, you know, a <laughs> hundred thousand more women that went through Auschwitz. Um, this is just a little to show you um, some of the, the uh, 999 um, research and, and the, and the covers, which I just love, and, and the languages, uh, which is really just extraordinary. Um, one of the things that's sort of interesting about 999, I think the reason it grabbed people's attention uh, is that it's it was right around the Me Too movement. And uh, and people uh, all over the world really took to this, this story of young women and and in Spain, especially, uh, every single um, interview that I did in Spain, they were wanted to talk about why haven't we ever known about this until now? And it's a really good question for your students. Like, why is this is untold? This is not known. This history, like me coming around and talking about this, and I'll go back to telling you, um, you know, this is, um, I've had arguments with, with, um, with, you know, top historians saying it wasn't the first transport. And, and, you know, and I think the reason they've been so against that is because, uh, I, my apologies, Michael, men own the history. And, and it makes men really uncomfortable to know that women suffer and girls suffer and we're targets. Um, so here we go. Like this is one of the targets, right? The description of the work they did, um, which we have in Rena's Promise uh, and in 999. There you go. Remember the throwing of the rocks? There it is. That's what they did. Look at that. That's what they did. It's so extraordinary. This footage, this film, this is, comes from a film that was shot in Poland. It's called Ostatia Atop or The Last Stage uh, in Poland in 1948. P these are all Poles. They're wearing their former uniforms. The director was a survivor. She was a Polish survivor and she, um, did this film in 1948 and we use it in our film because it is the only way it's the i mean it it is in some ways archival even though it's a narrative film because they are should they go into auschwitz two years they start shooting within a year and a half actually of the liberation and they go in and everything is there this is not a film set this is actually at Birkenau. And, and she got friends of hers. Everybody's wearing uh, their uniforms, their real numbers, and, and they are doing what they did when they were prisoners and showing us how they worked. It is, um, it, it's just amazing. And I, I tell you, when I saw this, I, I, you hear, you know, you read testimony and I was like, what? Like you rolled this thing? Like, what are you talking about? You had this big pole. And then I saw this, I was like, oh my God, that's what it is. That's what they were doing. It's absolutely crazy. Um, now this is a, a, a computer generated image. Uh, we don't end up not using this in the film, but we wanted to show uh, how crowded the camp got. So we created a computer generation. When the 999 arrive, um, they are in the front of the block, right? And you can see, I'll show it you again. Um, so this were, that would be 999 right there. There ended up being Nissan huts in between uh, the blocks where people, where women lived. There were women living actually outside because it was so crowded. And uh, and this is the beginning of the typhus epidemic. 
in uh, so this before they move into move to Birkenau, the uh, overcrowding in Auschwitz is so intense um, that they are just literally on top of each other, and 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 typhus is spreading throughout uh, throughout the camp. At, the SS started were dying of typhus. That's how bad the epidemic was. Um, sorry, I'm going to the next one. Uh, and this is Birkenau. So they we moved they moved to Birkenau as you remember in August 1942. Um, and this is a pretty good idea of what Birkenau looks like. It's huge. If you've never been there, you cannot imagine how big it is. The women's blocks are over on this side. This is the men's blocks. Uh, the railway did not exist when the girls arrived in 1942. <laughs> Excuse me, and they 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 practically built the camp themselves. Um, sorry, this is so. This is the map when they arrived in 1942. These are the blocks that exist, the brick blocks, um, and they they built them themselves. Nothing else here exists. It's not real, and that is what is constructed from 1942 into 1945. Eventually, um, the, tr rail, the tracks come in in the 44. Um, I think it's around January, February. Canada, um, where they were sorting clothing and everything, uh, that is um, that starts in 43. Sauna, uh, which is not the sauna that Rena talks about, but that's where uh, they were processing people and the crematoriums are just off uh, to the side here. Uh, this is an amazing photograph, and it is um, it is a posed photo. Most of the photographs that we have of women in Auschwitz are posed, and a lot of them, uh, a lot of the photos that you see of the liberation of Auschwitz were po were posed photos as well, and they were um, posed by Russians. These are posed by Germans, um, and uh, Linda Reich here. Um, she uh, talks about in her testimony, she says that they were, um, the photographer said, now make sure you smile and look like you're having fun. And he took this photo. Uh, this is Linda uh, Reich. This is uh, her friend, Mira Kornhauser. And this is Helena Citron, uh, who ends up having an affair with an SS. And here we go. Canada. So this is Canada. I'll show you again. So this is Canada right here. Boom. Right. This is where they're sorting all these. These are the um, they're filled with objects. Right. Uh, you know, baby carriages. You can see clothing. It's quite a quite intense and and lines of Jews just just on the outside here. Um, so I did travel to uh, Auschwitz with uh, children of survivors. Uh, this is a granddaughter of a survivor. She's walking through Canada here where her mother worked. This is a daughter. She's walking through the sauna. And I, just a little bit inside, if you haven't seen these, um, this uh, footage um, of, of the camp itself. So always we have to pay attention to liberation. Uh, it is, um, it's an extraordinary moment for liberation, um, but it didn't mean that everybody lived happily ever after. Um, I will just give you a couple of things. So the, the granddaughter who's walking and her mom, that's, that's her mother right there. We found that photo in um, the a Jewish archive and they could tell their mother was always knitting and she and her passport photo her ID photo, she had this outfit on. Um, there's Rena, and there's, oops, sorry, go back. There's, uh, so that's Rena and that's Danka. Um, this is Bertha Berkowitz. This was a posed photo of Bernga Belson. Of course, this woman is very thin, so they were, the, these are um, uh, British photographers. Uh, Bertha, just, you know, within 24 hours, this is her again, and she's showing the British soldiers, this is actually footage that I found at the Imperial War Museum, and she's walking through Bergen-Belsen showing the soldiers um, the bodies. Bergen-Belsen was um, liberated first, it was given to uh, the British to liberate because of a typhus epidemic, tens of thousands of prisoners had died, 
and were dying. It was really dangerous, very, very, very dangerous. This is an amazing photo right here. So these young women, um, are, they're all survivors and um, it was quite dangerous to be a young woman um, with soldiers running around to, you know, in liberation. And a lot of women got raped. Um, and, and these women, these men, uh, this is in Prague, these men escorted, walked these girls back to Slovakia. Um, and this is Marta Mengel, who was on the first transport. Uh, she's in our film. This is her cousin, Fanny. And this is her other cousin, Etta. And they survived with 12 cousins. Uh, and the reason they survived was they had one cousin who uh, unusually was a capo. She was a Jewish capo and she protected the rest of them. So this is um, this is the Gross, Gross and Grossman family. Um, this is, uh, we call her Dutsi, her name's uh, Deborah, and there she is. This is Adela Gross's elder sister who did not go to Auschwitz. She got married uh, right before the transport and she was able to avoid being uh, transported to Auschwitz. This is Leah, Edith's sister. So this is Edith here. And this is Leah, her sister. Um, this photo is, yeah, probably circa 1936. So there, um, I know it was Passover. Leah does not survive. She dies of typhus in 1942. Um, and this is Anna Hertzkovikova. She dies in Auschwitz. This is the girl that I mentioned in that picture with Adela and uh, Henya Ehrenberger with that little group. I think this woman, oops, sorry. You can hate each other, but not to kill. Wait, I have to go back. We have to go back. Um, okay, sorry. I don't know why that did that. Anyway, I, I think this woman looks a lot like that other girl in that picture, but I don't know. Um, this is Edith's husband, Ladislav Grossman, who is a very, very becomes a very, very famous author, and he did a film called The um, Shop on Main Street, which is considered by, um, uh, you know one of the top 100 films of all time. It won the Oscar in 1965. Um, this is uh, this is Anna, who lives in Israel, Anna Shved, and that's uh, Deborah's daughter. And this is George Grossman, Edith's son. And this is um, this is Yore Grossman, Deborah's uh, son. And I, for and I forget who those people are. Uh, and now for some family pictures of Rena and Danka. Um, this is Sylvia, um, Rena's daughter, giving her mom a big kiss. They loved it. Rena loved kisses. She'd come up to you and go, <laughs> it's always a hug, big hugger. This is Rena and Danka when they were younger. Both of them ended up with Alzheimer's um, and it was, a, it was a very long, slow death. Um, this is Rena about probably a year before she died. Um, this is Danka um, in in bed with Sylvia. We went to see her, and um, and this is Danka there with her with her daughter, and I love this photo. So this is Danka actually gave testimony in New York to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which I actually never had seen this, and this is her granddaughter Jenna who just had twins, and um, she was so excited to see her grandmother's testimony. And this is our last, I will end this with a little bit from Edith. You can hate each other, but not to kill each other. I said so many nice words, you know, but uh, tell me, who is listening to me? I wanted so much the world to listen to. So that's our job, folks to make the world listen um and i love that that edith said that to me and that was our last conversation and like rena said to um us uh to hate is to let hitler win um edith uh i love that she said you know you can hate each other just don't kill each other and certainly we need to hear that <laughs> right now right um, so I'm just going to show you, uh, again, this is our um, website there. We do have um, a 
a tab here for education. I know you guys have a curriculum and everything. Uh, we were trying to set up, um, you know, things for students to do. And um, let's turn that music off. Uh, and, and ideas for study. And the Promise Project, I think that link doesn't work anymore, um, which is too bad. Uh, I was trying to create a map. At that point, it was quite small. I need to update this website, but the person who has the password to it has disappeared. And I apologize because we had an interactive Holocaust timeline that focused on women and it's no longer up. Um, but if I do ever get around to it, I will update it and let Amy know. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to let you know is we have, uh, I have a YouTube channel and uh, you can actually see Rena there. So there's lots of material in here. Yeah, I was taught this is well called at home. I'm not very tall, but I was going. You got an idea of how quickly she spoke. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, and I will say, and I'm not sure I'm going to see it. Um, oh, so this is, it might be fun if you're doing it, if you have the kids any. Um, research. Uh, some of these, this one, I discovered what happened to mama and papa. Uh, if you haven't seen that. Um, and I actually uh, have one in here. Uh, it will totally make you cry. Uh, and I'm not sure where it is, but it is, um, I found Anji Gabera's grave in Tillage. Um, it was, I tell you, I sobbed, <laughs> sobbed my eyes out. Um, I'm not sure I can see it. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, so there you go. There's lots of things in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so have at it. If you've got research going on with your students, uh, you know, I'm here for to see if I can answer any questions for you. Thanks so much. Now I can shut up. <laughs> Um, so one question was, um, what is the lasting message um, that you want students to take away from, from this book? Uh, yeah, well, I think that's it. You can hate each other, just don't kill each other. Um, and, you know, it, and it's, uh, it's, you know, hate is poison. It really is. And, and we don't, we tend not to understand that, uh, you know, as young people, um, you know, we're very emotional and our, everything, everything is high or low and, but, uh, but nothing, uh, what R Edith says to me, war serves no one. It's actually how we end our film. War serves no one. I mean, it serves Putin. It serves Hamas. It serves BB. It serves, you know, it serves, the guys in the little booth, it's like the Hunger Games, right? The guy in the booth, it's fine. But those of us who down, yeah, it doesn't serve us at all. And and Edith says, um, you know, you are losing houses, you're losing economy, you're losing your kids, right? That's not a win. It's, it's no win. And, uh, and, and, and I, I, you know, I think that, I think the message is, it's an anti-war message and it is a message uh, for um, looking for commonality. How do we connect to each other? Where do we find, um, you know, that's why I think if we personalize the history, we see the faces, then we don't go, oh, I don't like Jews, right? Or, oh, I don't like, I, I don't, I don't like Palestinians, right? And you see a face of a little child right? It's like, oh, this is a real person. They're not a label, you know, it, and, and it expands. I mean, I, 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 um, I have used Rena's promise in the classroom, uh, with, um, with African American lives by Henry Louis, um, Gates Jr. on PBS. I've used it in relation to homosexuality and trans rights, you know, that, you know, Rena would say, um, it, you know, if you're getting picked on, Rena would defend you, right? Like it doesn't matter who you are, she would stand up for you um, and, and, and stop the bullies. 
And, and I think that that's a really great message for all of us to stop the bullying. And war is nothing more than a big bully, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you for that. I think that that was just such a great, I, I think we're all feeling just as we're looking at the world today, just a kind of heaviness. And I think your message is very timely um, for sure. So there were some questions just about um, Rena in general and, and connection. And so the first question was, how did you originally connect with Rena? Well, it's in the book. <laughs> Um, but it was through a friend of mine who was in, at her tennis club and, uh, and, you know, she and I, we just connected and I, I'm not sure what it is, but, um, but I have seen it happen again and again. And I had the same connection with Edith, um, and, uh, Elizabeth who was in Sydney, Australia. I, I couldn't fly there because of COVID. Um, and I had to get, um, you know, after after we were free of lockdowns, um, I got a cinematographer there to film her, and and they set they set up the um, film, the camera, and everything, and and they had me set up so I could see, um, so I could see what they were shooting, but she couldn't see my face, and she said, "I I want I need to see Heather's face if I'm going to tell this story." And they turned it around. I was like, yeah, 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 of course, you know. And as soon as we looked into each other's eyes, boom, it was like we were there. And I tell you, I mean, I she just grabbed my heart and I grabbed hers. We were we were very, very close for the last couple of years of her life. I just loved her. So I I I guess I just have a connection to little old ladies. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you know, Rena and I, we were just we just loved each other. We sat there and we held hands and we talked. And I used to, you know, I used to stay at Rena's house on the weekends. I used to fly to Toronto and, and, and live with Edith and walk around and we would eat and laugh and talk and um, spend a couple of days together and take the bus down to the grocery store. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, it, it, that, um, I, I can't explain it, but I will say that they're not old women. They're still teenage girls. And 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 there's a part of me that's a teenage girl, and I think that's where we connect. Um, what was the most difficult part of writing Rena's Promise? Um, oh, that's easy. Uh, <laughs> um, that would be the children going to the gas chamber. And, um, you know, it's really interesting when you're um, interviewing trauma survivors, um, the, a lot of times the trauma is the shortest part of the tape. And, and literally, I, I, you know, Rena says in, in the tape, she says, I saw kids go to the gas chamber and I, and I, and this SS woman, SS Hasa came up and said, where's your God now? Dink. Next thing starts talking about something else, and I'm like, <laughs> "Wait a minute!" Um, so I went back about a year later. Uh, I went to a, I was actually working with a trauma therapist when I was interviewing her because I did not want to uh, re-traumatize her, and I wanted. I, I know she wasn't going to go to a therapist. It's not, you know, that's not her generation. Um, so I wanted to make sure I did things right. And, and I said, you know, there's this little blip on the tape and I, and I have to go, I, I know there's more there. Um, how do I get, get to it? And he said, so he told me what to do. And, and so I called her up and I said, I'm going to come up and I'm gonna, we're going to have lunch and, you know, I'm going to see you on Saturday and we're only going to talk for an hour. All we're going to talk about, we're not even going to talk for an hour. I said, all we're going to talk about I just need you to tell me about the kids going to the gas chamber and, and then we're going to go out to lunch and drink Brandy Alexander's. She loved Brandy Alexander's. <laughs> and so I got up there and she was very nervous, super, super nervous. And we sat down and we were very quiet and I just said, so what was the weather like? And I just took her through it, you know, like, uh, 
so I could get the details. Was there snow? Was there sun? Um, and I got, I got, you know, it wasn't even, it, it was maybe five minutes of talking or less. And I took the tape home and I listened to it and I listened to it and I listened to it. There was nothing to transcribe. It was really just factual and a lot of sobbing, a lot, a lot of sobbing. And I listened and I listened I, and I just sort of, I don't know, I guess I soaked it up and then I just wrote and I wrote for, I don't know how long, but when then I was done writing, I had tears streaming down my face. I don't remember writing it. I read it and I went, that's it. And I never touched it again. And when Rena read it, she said, I don't know how you did this. You must have read the story. You mu must have read my tears to know what happened. Um, that, so that's how I did it. Um, so you had mentioned, well, you'd mentioned earlier that there were some photos, um, of Rena's family in the book. How did those survive the war? Oh, well, she, her, um, she had a sister who had emigrated to America. So her mother sent photos. So all of the surviving photos belonged to Gertrude. And when the girls survived, um, Gertrude made copies of the photos so that they, they could have them in the family. So did her mom do that because that she knew or did uh, she no, then, no, oh, she no, didn't know, she no, just no, sent it? No, Gertrude was, um, so you have to remember um, there were four girls, Gertrude and Zosha. Gertrude was, I, may, I think, 20 years older than, than Rena. I, I know Gertrude died when I first met Rena. That was in 1992. And Gertrude died like a year later. So she was, she was in her, you know, eighties. Um, and then Zosha probably, she died in the Holocaust, probably in Auschwitz. Um, I never found her name in any of the lists. Um, and uh, yeah, and then Danka and Rena. I think Zosha, I think Rena was 10 years younger than Zosha. I think that's right. So maybe Gertrude was 15 years, anyway. And then um, what, how did Rena end up in North Carolina? So funny. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, they were going to retire. They're up in Connecticut. Um, they, and I forget how they came down to North Carolina. It might've been just on a vacation trip or something, but the moment she saw Hendersonville, it reminded her of the Carpathian Mountains. And so she wanted to move there. So they built a house and they moved to Hendersonville. And um, and there was a there was a cow in a field at the end of their property. And she, you know, she just loved it because there was a cow in the field where she was growing up. I will say, um, you know, uh, the. Um, I'm just looking to see uh, if I've got it here. Some of the footage that I have on YouTube shows you tillage. And um, it is still really small <laughs> and she, lots of snow. Um, and it is quite extraordinary to, to you head up these um, uh, from Krenica, uh you, you go up um, hairpin turns and you get up into the mountains. There's more and more snow that there's enormous pines, just enormous, really dark, gorgeous um pines that are you know it, it, this is old forest it's not it's not been lumbered and uh and then you get to tillage and it's a ski resort now there's lots of ski there's lots of skiing and they're and they're playing abba over <laughs> loudspeakers on the ski. and there's about three um three catholic churches and uh and there's two graveyards and there's like one tiny little restaurant and there's a very tiny library um, and the village square. And I, I went there with um, with Erna uh, and Fela's sons, uh, Avi and Akiva, they came in from Israel and we went to Tillage and um, they spoke a tiny bit of Polish. And it was, we they got into the library and, and the, the library was amazing. 
Um, it's like just one floor. Right, and, sorry, not a library. It's a museum. It's a museum of tillage. It's, the library is on one floor and you go up and there's the, the museum, which is like up in a, the eaves, this little attic. <laughs> and um, and they say to the woman, the curator or whatever, they say, um, there's no Jews. Where where are the Jews in your museum? And she said, tillage never had Jews. And and they were like, oh, they were so angry. And uh, and he says to her in Polish, we're Jewish and our mother grew up here and she didn't know what to say. She was absolutely so uncomfortable. And we go through and they find one little carving of a caricature of a, of a Jewish man with a big nose and he's got a cart and... and <laughs> Avi picks it up, or Kiva picks it up and goes, goes, look, a Jew. <laughs> it's like, that's it. Um, it, yeah, I mean, they just completely wiped out. And their um, their uncle, uh, Erna and Fella's brother, returned to tillage and was murdered after the war. I never knew that really really i mean it is um yeah it's hard it's really it's 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 they were it's just really really sad um i found another woman from uh Krenica who rena and danka must have known her name is sarah blake um and she survived and emigrated to argentina and um and, you know, it's like one of the, you find these women and you're like, oh, my God, I wish I could go to Rena and say, did you know Sarah Blake? You know, oh, I know Sarah Blake. Oh, she survived. You know, like we would have had these amazing conversations. Um, it's just, you know, it's it's extraordinary to have this history. Um, so let's see. The, oh, the death. Yeah. Um, OK. The death of Rena's parents um, is. Uh, no, that that is not confirmed. Um, so for those of you who remember, um, the the woman says that her parents came back to um, Tillage and they were in the Novosage ghetto and they went to return to Tillage and, and they were murdered um, there. That's not possible. Novosage ghetto, they would never have gotten out of. And um, I've been to Novosage and, um, and I did find out what happened. Uh, and basically uh, in the Novosaj ghetto, um, and I forget the date, um, but uh, they, they took all the um, elderly Jews and actually, um, and all of the, uh, the rabbi, anybody who was important and the elderly Jews and any Gentiles who refused to um, refused to quit um, any friendly Gentiles to Jews. Uh, there was a shopkeeper who worked with a Jewish man and he was taken and they were all taken to the river and shot and executed. And that's where the Jewish graveyard is today. So that's what happened in moment. Um, and then I think there was a question about, um, Rena talks about several male boyfriends. Um, did she ever expand on who she really loved before her husband? Oh, Angie Garbera. Yeah. yeah. He was definitely the love of her life. And uh, before John. And, um, you know, he was a great character. Um, when I, uh, I, I need tissues. <laughs> When I went to Tillage, um, I wanted to find his gravestone and uh, there's all of the snow. And and I, um, I'd gone to two other graveyards, didn't find anything. And I was ready to leave. And I was driving away and I saw, um, I saw this another, another church, which looked very old. And there was a bridge and a river, a little creek. And I went, I went, it's like, I don't know about you guys, but you get these moments where you just go, oh, like that's it, right? And I pulled over and I stopped and I walked into the snow, like it was, you know, knee deep, cr 
crunching through the snow. And um, and I found a grave that said Garbera, but it had another name on it. So I knew I was close. And I had this moment in that graveyard. If you remember, um, you know, Rena goes into the graveyard and, and there's an SS there or, um, or a, a, a soldier and she can't, uh, she can't do anything because she's a Jew and it's a Gentile graveyard. So I was looking for Anji so I could do for her at his grave, out which she couldn't. And I had this moment where I felt like there was a soldier there at the gate, you know, like I was like, like I was there and it, I felt like I was in this time warp. And I'm walking through the graveyard and I don't, uh, you know, like, I don't know where to look. And and I see an RA and the rest of it is covered in snow. And it's another of that, like, and I stop and I turn the camera on. <laughs> That's like, and I reach over and I push the snow back and it says Anji Garbear. And then you hear me sobbing. <laughs> and then I took, uh, I took flowers to the grave. And I swear, I swear to you, I heard Rena saying, thank you, Heather. It was just like such an amazing, um, you know, I have all these amazing experiences throughout this, you know, this, uh, this 30 years of research. And a lot of it feels um, other guided by other things. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty good listener, intuitive listener. And um, and I will say that they've just had some amazing moments where I've just, you know, had had the luck to find that little key that connects everything. It's like dominoes and you go, there it is. Adela is one of those pieces. I think that's all the questions. Heather, um, this was amazing. We can't thank you enough for your time and generosity and sharing Rena with us again. Rena is a touchstone for me. I shared that with you. She is one of the reasons why I am involved in Holocaust education. And to meet you and have that connection has just been amazing. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you everyone for um coming tonight and look I also, to let me just work. add you know if you want if um i've done so i've um i'm happy to talk with classes you know if if you want um if you want me to if you have students that want to um you know ask questions or you know just have a conversation i'm, I'm happy to do that i love i love this work and uh, if i'm available i'm certainly uh, available for your students thank you for that thank you yeah thank you that's some that's good to know i could let the teachers know that who buy the book yeah yeah all right well um i think that ends our webinar for tonight again thank you for coming and uh thank you so much heather we we so appreciate you um and i will be sending out emails with the evaluation web link and your ceus will follow after that so good night have a good night Thank you for coming. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Meredith. Hey, Meredith. <laughs> oh, Lori is actually recording, so I'll let her. I don't know, Lori, are you still around?
I don't know. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. Um, and I do want to hear, I don't, I know it's late and y'all got school tomorrow. I don't, <laughs> Carrie wanted to share a little bit about the elective. If you guys need to go, you can go on. Um, thank you for, for helping me though. I really do appreciate it. This is probably the only one we will have to do this year. Um, I know we've got one coming up with, I hope y'all can come to this one too in January with Alexandra Spruder. Um, She's that's so be, good. Yeah, that will be a great one too. So um, can we, do, do we have the ability to exit people? Yes, y'all should. So. Yes, yes, I think I can. I will, uh, oh, well, there went somebody. That was Meredith. Yeah. Meredith w wanted to hear this because she teaches Rena's Promise. Lori, are you still here? Lori. I don't know. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and start. Yeah, and just, just go ahead. Spill out. the tea. Spill the tea, Carrie. Oh, no, it was, <laughs> it is crazy. Like it makes, like everything that, because we all, right, we all were there when we did the, the social studies in England. Okay. So like, that was so great because things were outlined and people actually knew what they were talking about. Y'all, this is like a hot mess. They have given us these objectives that somebody has helped them. And I don't know who is, they're like the experts. And I'm like, well, who the heck are these experts you're talking to? But they've created these like objectives, which are like the standards. But my understanding of how this was supposed to be put together was that somebody, you know, like with the English and the social studies um curriculum that somebody could pick it up and like easily use it figure it out all that kind of stuff well y'all this ain't it um you would have to have like a pretty in-depth understanding to even understand like how the objectives like what order they go in there's not even one about like jewish tradition history culture religion anything um i got frustrated just looking at the printouts that they gave us and then they told us, you know, with these objectives, we need to go through and add like the topics, right? The big key ideas, um, names, places, all that kind of stuff. So we, we did that, we, we nailed that. The next part is in like this middle column, they wanted us to put activities and we all thought that they were supposed to be like summative activities, like big, you know, like a project or something. Well, we just found out last night that they're supposed to be, um, formative so it's like end of class basically kind of thing and I'm like you mean exit ticket that's what you want us to create they're like well, we just want to see you know ways of gathering that information of what they've learned and I'm like that's an exit ticket and I think you can make that on your own and then in the other column they want us to list primary sources which Lori you probably know like the recent new history standards. I don't know if they did this for middle school, but for high school, they came out with this massive list of primary sources that you can utilize. Well, I don't know about y'all, but my children cannot read a primary source, especially the ones that they're putting on there, like the whole thing. And I'm like, no, th this is not going to work. But anyway, so we went through and we were like, okay, but <clears throat> you know, like films or maps that you know, the Holocaust Museum is already put together. Like, can we put those? And they're like, yeah, but you can't put links because I don't know what they were saying, but it's like, you just have to put, if you typed it into Google, what could you find? And, or like, it needs to be the first thing that comes up. And I'm like, why are we making this more work than it needs to be? I don't know. It is, we had a meeting last night and I'm even more confused now about what we're supposed to be doing than before because communication is not clear. They don't know the content. Therefore, they don't really know what they're trying to tell us. They've never taught the class before. Y'all, it's a mess. <laughs> it is so bad. Well, we're recording right now. <laughs> yeah. So I can't. 
say a whole lot. Um, I'm not surprised though. Oh, and I'm I mean, sorry. yeah. Um, I, I've shared some things with Jessica and, um, this you is can just... text me later. <laughs> I was going to say, we all need to get together sometime. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah, we do. Maybe oh. we could get, maybe I, I know break is a busy time for everybody. And I don't know what the heck kind of schedule Andrew has. I, I was like, what? he said, I can get together January 3rd. And I said, well, we're back in school by January 3rd. They must get yeah. out later or something. I don't know. They but don't yeah. get out until the 20. What did he say, Laura? I think you said the 22nd. Ah, uh, we don't get out to the 20th this year. So we get out the 15th. Yeah, yeah, so do we. And they did that to us like the 22nd one year and people must have complained because it's hard to get stuff ready for Christmas when you're out the 22nd. Mm -hmm. We're out the 15th too. And then we go yeah. back. The second. Yeah, I don't know what our schedule has been so jacked up this year. Oh my gosh. I just, uh, we had to go Wednesday last week, uh, a half a day, which was oh gosh pointless. But yeah. guess, guess which grade level had the best attendance in the building? yours Seven. yeah Seven. yeah mm. oh gosh what yeah we had earth did they have you go to school on wednesday that is the dumbest thing i've ever heard yeah. I, I know I it's know. just to mark another day off yeah they know yeah. there's no instruction happening yeah but we got two days off um for veterans day we got the friday off which you know was great but we got that thursday off too for a fall break We've never had a fall break. I I don't know. Uh, mm, mm. You it's, would have rather had Wednesday off. Yeah, absolutely. 110%. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Well, Clearly wasn't somebody who cooks Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. I would love to, I would love to hear more, Carrie. I, you know, if we can't all get together, I would love to get together with you and, and just hear what all has gone on. This was the in cat retreat thing, right? Mm -hmm. For the week long at, Ocracoke. Thankfully, Grayson is there, and then also Kinsley King. So there are there are a few people, and then there's a girl that um, I studied abroad with in college that also graduated with the the minor, and also teaches like the elective course. But they were like, we want to get a diverse group from across the state. Well, shit, y'all. There's like ten. I'm not joking. There's at least six people from Wake County out of sixteen. Now mm -hmm. tell me how that's diverse. Hmm. Have they put a timeline on this? Like when? January 31st. But then they like basically ripped us a new one last night trying to say, well, like what you're doing is not what we wanted. And I'm like, we don't know what you want. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even think y'all know what you want. Because Probably I not. thought, again, my thinking, and this is what we kind of complained to them about. I was real. I did not um, limit my. Good. You need to speak up and you need to speak up and speak out. Oh, yeah. I did because I was like, when they gave us those objectives, I was like, y'all, these really don't make any sense, and you are not making this content, which is already difficult to teach, in just emotion. But then also, if you're giving this to a teacher that maybe is not as familiar with it, then what the heck they're gonna do? Like it is. And, and not being clear on something like an elective, well, any, anything you do with the Holocaust, not being clear and not mm -hmm. having following those pedagogical guidelines is dangerous. Right. It's just dangerous. Well, and then they also said that a lot of our activities were presenting information and they're like, is it really beneficial for your students to present? And I'm like, yeah, one, yes. there is a ton of content that we have to cover in this course. So, you know, we can't cover it all. And two, you're teaching your students how to research appropriately by finding credible sources. And three, you're teaching them how to have difficult conversations. So, mm -hmm. yes, they know what they're getting into when they take this course. Mm -hmm. They should be mature enough and you should enable your students and teach them those skills because that's only not going to benefit them, obviously, in this class, but in life. I, they were just like, is that really the best way to be doing this? And I'm like, well, I don't really know how you cover talking about many of the different camps or the different ghettos 
without actually, you know, having students do some research because they're so numerous and they're all different. Like, yeah, I mean, you can just tell they haven't been in the classroom in a hot minute. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they probably weren't in there very long before probably. they weren't in the classroom. Anyway. Probably not. <laughs> I was texting Grayson last night and I'm like, Grayson, what are we like? She and I are in two different groups. And I'm like the group leader for my group. One girl had no idea of the content at all. Um, I had put something in there about the poisonous mushroom by Julia Stryker. And then later down in the list, she put Julia Stryker's children's book. Do what? You you cut out. Sorry. I had put in, you know, like, um, the poisonous mushroom by Julia Stryker. And then later on, somewhere down the list, she put Julia Stryker's children's book, not even knowing. I mean, every time we were typing, every time we were typing something, she was copy and pasting to research it. And then the other guy in my group, he um, tore his Achilles tendon, so wasn't there. And then there's only one other girl that's like, she and I basically did all of what we've got, but apparently we have to delete it all at this point. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, and we do need to get together because that can be a whole lot more forthcoming <laughs> with a lot of things. Yeah, girl. I record Zoom. And I know you guys need to go. You need to go because you got to get in the bed and get up and do it again tomorrow. And I hope that Christmas break comes quick. I know you need a break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It was seeing y'all. Bye. Yeah, I love Bye. you guys. See you Bye. later. Bye. 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 I can stay, I can stay locked in.